Um, yes, hello. Uh, my name is uh, Kevin Critchley, and uh, I'm based at the University of Leeds. And I am a uh, uh, professor who works on uh, molecular and nanoscale uh, physics. And so I'm uh, work at the, although I'm in, based in a physics department, I very much work at the boundary between chemistry, biology, and physics, uh, and combining all these different things to try and achieve some, some goals within nanoscience and nanotechnology. So today I'm going to be giving uh, an introduction really to, to nanoscience and nanotechnology, and I'm going to touch on some of the research topics that which I, uh, I work on. So first of all, where is uh, the University of Leeds? Well, the University of Leeds is in the, the, the north of, uh, uh, of the UK, not as far as Scotland, but up here in the, in, in the middle here. Uh, and it's around about uh, uh, 250 miles for, from London, uh, so a little bit further north. And what we our department is famous for is uh, this famous scientist, William Bragg, who won a Nobel Prize in 1915 for his work uh, of the analysis of, of crystals. So in other words, he developed the technique of X-ray diffraction, which is used very widely now to understand uh, the crystalline properties of, of not just um, uh, regular crystals, but also biological materials. So uh, that really inspired a lot of work that went on in Leeds. And now we have the Asprey Center, which deals with uh, X-ray analysis of, of proteins uh, in the biology department. So Yorkshire climate is uh, very dramatically different from one season to the next. So in the summer, uh, on the left-hand side, or uh, just outside Leeds, you can travel into the countryside and you see these beautiful cre green scenes, uh, uh, farmland. Uh, and then uh, just one week ago, uh, this was the scenes uh, from those uh, same hills. It was thick, thick snow. Thankfully, all that is now uh, melted and we're back to just being cold and uh, wet. But yeah, very dramatic weather changes uh, over the year that we experience up in, in Leeds. But very typical British weather, right? Yeah, very typical. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We talk about the weather all the time. Uh, so uh, Leeds is, is, is ranked in the, one of the top 100 universities uh, based on the QS World University rankings of 2021. And within the UK, we're part of a, a Russell group, which is really the research intensive universities. And there's about 20 universities in that group. Uh, we have about 38,000 uh, students uh, within the university. Uh, and of those, there's about 10,000 uh, postgraduates. So we are one of the larger of the uh, UK uh, universities. And within that, we have uh, 9,000 international students from more than 170 uh, countries. So we are very uh, international and outward looking. Uh, and we have 9,200 SNAF. Uh, and again, they're from over 100 countries uh, between them. So uh, I, as I said, I work in a molecular uh, and nanoscale physics groups. This is a photograph from uh, a couple of years ago now. We have about 14 uh, academics, um, more than eight PDRAs, it varies from time to time, and more than 20 PhD students with, within the group. And really we have a very broad range of interests. Um, going from uh, biomaterials, nanomedicine, healthcare, which is really one of my main interests, through to things like uh, um, uh, nucleation and crystal growth or microbubbles and for agnostics. So really a, a, a wide range of, of topics. Each academic really looks after a, a different area. Um, so I'm going to be touching on some aspects uh, of, of these, but, but of course, <laughs> impossible in the, the time to cover cover them all. So I will talk about uh, some of the uh, advances that we've made. And I'll also point out that we uh, have developed the world's finished gold. So this is um, uh, some work with m myself and um, Professor Steve Heavens, who, who runs the molecular and nanoscale group. Uh, and this uh, 
example here of, of gold is it's actually false colored but this gold is is just um two atoms thick so uh, i'll come to that a little bit later so some of my research then um i work with quantum dots and i'll explain later what quantum dots are and why they're important why they're interesting i also work with nanomaterials for imaging sensing uh, and therapeutics and I do uh, not so much anymore, but I used to do a lot of transport measurements within nanomaterials. So actually passing some current through some electrons through uh, a, a wire and measuring the, the properties of uh, uh, the electronic properties of those wires. And going way, way back, I, I used to do a lot more of this, but I would do surface functionalization. It turns out, uh, so I used to do this on flat surfaces, very plain plain flat gold surfaces, for example. Uh, but it turns out this is extremely useful actually for, for all different geometries of nanomaterials. So I do a lot of surface uh, functionalization, but not so much this type on a two-dimensional uh, surface. So what is uh, nanotechnology uh, after all? Well, here's the Oxford Dictionary definition. It's the branch of technology that deals with dimensions and tolerances of less than 100 nanometers, especially the manipulation of individual atoms and molecules. So that's a, quite a, a, a broad definition. Uh, I think some uh, nanotechnologists would disagree with some aspects of that. Some of them believe that it's uh, slightly larger than 100 nanometers. They believe that nanotechnology is anything that's less than you know 500 nanometers or so. But non nonetheless, it, it gives us a, a guide to what we are really talking about. So. Here's an example here of, of, of some building. Uh, these are the Alara Caves in uh, India, and they are, are basically buildings that have been carved from the stone. So taking a, a large rock face and, and literally chipping bits out of that, uh, that rock until you have the space and the structure that, that you want. So this is really kind of uh, one way of, of, of making a building, right? Take a big substance and, and break it down uh, and, and cut it in such a way that you've got the structure that you want. Then you've got the other example, of course, uh, and you have in Egypt is the pyramids, and these are built by assembling blocks of, of a well-defined shape and size and building them upwards. So you have individual blocks making a much larger structure. And this is seen as actually a much more efficient process than carving from, from a stone from rock faces. Now, and then, Nowadays, we see lots of these buildings uh, going up in uh, around the world, and this is a, a building in Dubai. And here we combine many different construction materials, and we have, uh, uh, and we have lots of uh, components of different sizes and different shapes and different materials, and we assemble them all together to get the desired uh, structure. So this is um, building up, and this is. Uh, a top-down approach. The Ellera Caves are effectively a top-down approach. In a sense, nanotechnology is a lot about building up from the bottom. So taking our blocks and building them up into the material that we want them to be or the shape that we want them to be. So we have our building blocks. And now Lego is one of the best toys uh, that you can have as a child because you can if you have lots of these blocks, you can make anything you want. You can make a car, you can make an aeroplane, you can make a house, you can make anything you do desire out of, out of these blocks. You just need the right number of blocks to enable you to do that. And really, nanotechnology in essence is all about this. It's all about having Lego blocks to, to build with. But what are these uh, Lego blocks? What are we really talking about? when we're talking about nanotechnology. So in 1959, uh, Richard Feynman gave a lecture at the American Physical Society. 
uh, in titles, there is plenty of room at the bottom. And he gave a lecture and how he describes how there is no reason why, why we couldn't make, you know, tiny machines um, much, much smaller than we can today. Uh, and uh, and use these uh, to, pro to perform functions, but also store I information. And he described how you could fit the entire series of uh, of encyclopedias of Britannia onto a pinhead. Um, and he really sets a challenge to scientists to come up with ways and methods of actually realizing these tiny machines and, and storage devices. So this is way back in 1959. You can actually see a repeat of the lecture that he gave. Um, he gave it many years later in the early 1980s, and you can see this uh, uh, on YouTube if you if you do a quick search for there is plenty of room at the bottom. And it's a fantastically inspiring uh, presentation. So what was his point? Well, how small is small is really what he was talking about. And so to make something useful, uh, as I was saying with our Lego brick example, you need tens, uh, hundreds, maybe a thousand bricks uh, to, to make a useful functioning structure that, that you can recognize and can do a job. And really our smallest possible uh, building block, the smallest thing that we can use or access are atoms. These are between 0 0.1 to 0 0.4 nanometers. So a billionth, uh, a one tenth of a billionth of a meter. Uh, and so therefore, when you really think about it, you can't make a device out of a, a, a single atom. They need to be at least a few atoms fixed. So, so therefore, it gives us this sort of lower possible limit of making any sort of device, which is around about one nanometer. I mean, that's the minimum that we could possibly work with. So realistically, nanometers, a few nanometers, are the dimensions of the smallest possible machines that we can make. And this is where we're all tending towards and what we're all trying to achieve uh, as, as, as nanoscientists and nanotechnologists. So has this been realized yet? Well, here's an example of, uh, of, of work from IBM from a number of years ago now. They used uh, very um, expensive equipment, um, a scanning tunneling uh, microscope, which uh, was operated at five degrees Kelvin, so very close to absolute zero. And they were able to not only image individual atoms that you can see uh, on, on these on the figures here, but also pick up these atoms, uh, manipulate them and place them down uh, where they wanted them. So here they made a circle of, of atoms on a, on, a, on a substrate and each one of these bumps that you can see is actually uh, an individual atom and the substrate that it sits on is actually uh, copper so extremely smooth uh, surface to enable them to uh, uh, achieve this and what is really nice is you can even see a buildup of level of wavy structure that passes through to the to the to the center like a ripple as if as though a stone has been thrown into the center of a pond uh, and this really is a quantum mechanical effect that we're observing here where we're seeing the wave like properties of, of the electrons in the atoms starting to combine to make an interference effect so to enable them to do this, they need an extremely sharp tip, which moves uh, over the surface very closely. And they use a feedback loop, which is the current electricity passing between the tip and the surface to enable them to do that. And they needed to do this at extremely cold temperatures because otherwise the atoms would just move too quickly. They would move under Brownian motion, so they would start to wander away from the, their structure before they could manage to get the next one in place. So this is an example of the kind of uh, equipment. It's 
ultra high vacuum, so it's operating at 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the minus 11 millibar. Uh, it's very large. It costs a lot of money, probably uh, close to a million pounds worth of equipment, if not uh, more, and very, very sensitive and very, very specialized and difficult to use. The IBM group also uh, constructed um, the world's, they use this technique to make the world's smallest stop motion uh, film. And I don't mean the, the smallest in terms of length in time, uh, the smallest in terms of uh, physical dimensions. And it's called A Boy and His Atom. And it's actually the whole uh, sequence is around about uh, one and a half minutes long. And you can, uh, again, you can find this on YouTube if you have a look. Uh, and this is uh, amazing um, kind of ability for them to have manipulated every single atom in the, each of these frames to enable them to make uh, a complete film of, of based on, on, on atoms. And they concluded from the scientific point of view that one bit of information uh, can be stored using 12 atoms. And currently we use ar around about a million. So clearly there's uh, huge advances in terms of what could be achieved in terms of storage. However, this technology is not something that's going to sit in your uh, living room or, or, or indeed in, even in many top end uh, labs at this stage. So we're a long way from adapting this kind of technology into our every everyday world. Nonetheless, it, it really is a, quite an exciting thing to be able to be alive today in this generation. We are the first generation that can not only see atoms, but we're the first generation that can actually manipulate individual atoms to where we want them to be and make the structures from single atoms upwards. Never before has this been possible. So this really is opening up a whole range of new opportunities. However, um, the caveat to this is the manipulation of atoms uh, is generally very slow. Uh, you can only build one device at a time in, in, in each instrument that you have you need to have um, you know you need to have your device attached to a substrate and you have a currently very expensive instrumentation that's very sensitive uh, to it to achieve that so perhaps this is a great example but it's not going to build us the everyday nanotechnology that we that we uh, have or, or, or want to have in our everyday life so let's take a, a, another example. What, what, what about biology and what biology has to offer? So biology uh, assembles very complicated molecular systems that perform jobs to create life effectively and do various jobs. So uh, a, an extraordinary fact is that, you know, each one of your cells is, is performing the job of producing proteins of every moment of, of, of of the day and you can think of actually uh, the cell each cell as being rather like a, a protein factory so uh, within the cell you have uh, ribosomes uh, and ribosomes are, are effectively the the main um, contrib contributor to to making uh, proteins so Within your nucleus, you have, of course, DNA, and uh, uh, and within that DNA, you have the genetic codes, which can then release uh, mRNA uh, from the nucleus, and this then binds to these uh, ribosomes within the cell. And then uh, tRNA, which is is around in the cytoplasm, carries specific amino acids that then bind to the mRNA sequence, which is shown in this little figure on the bottom left, which en enables the amino acid sequence uh, to form. So very specific key, uh, 
chemical sequence is being established. And each one of these amino acids is bound together by a, a peptide bond. And so this, this process is phenomenal. And this, and you can see lots and lots of YouTube clips of this again. And I find this extraordinary that this happens in every single cell of your body uh, every, every day, well, with the exception of a few of a few cells which don't do this, of course. And so these amino acid sequences form the uh, primary structure. And then the, the, these uh, amino acids then form a, a secondary protein structure. So they undergo a certain degree of binding and, uh, and folding uh, to form either sheets or helical uh, um, structures. So so-called alpha helix structures or beta pleated sheets. And these uh, are, are held together through, through hydrogen bonding. So the, these OH groups binding to uh, NH groups uh, across uh, the amino acid uh, sequence. These then go on. Uh, so you can have a very long sequence of amino acids. These then go on to, to uh, a third level of a uh, protein st of structure which generates the protein uh, shape so very recently uh, in the news there was this um, development that um, a artificial intelligence had developed a method called deep mind alpha fold for uh, predicting how these amino acid sequences would fold and become protein structures. And this has been a challenge for many decades, is, is to understand or, or to predict how an amino acid sequence would eventually obtain the protein uh, structure of choice. Only problem with artificial intelligence is it it's rather a, a black box. So we're no closer to understanding the, the theoretical underlying physics behind all this. Nonetheless, though, it, it's uh, a, a great strength uh, and great push forwards to be able to to predict it from 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 the sequences so why am i telling you all this and what's its relevance to nanotechnology well proteins are all on the nanoscale and and they're all, all on the nanoscale in size so they're all a, a few nanometers uh, across and they're all being produced uh within the cell all the same you know each each protein type is is being uh, made in the same way over and over and over again within within your cells to enormously uh, fantastic uh, pre precision. So if we could take a little bit of this uh, technology here uh, and, and expand it into some of the other materials that are kind of more technologically important to us right now, we'd be able to generate a lot more um, precise uh, devices and structures that we could then go on to use in uh, technology. So th this is a, 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 an example of a, of a protein uh, that is found in your cells. It's called myosin and it's a motor protein. And this motor protein has the job of carrying cargo through your cells. And along the bottom here is uh, an actin filament which you have in the in the scaffold of, of your cells. And really the job of these motors is to carry a various cargo that your cells require uh, to, to function. Um, so again, here's a system here where we have a, a motor that is being produced uh, by bio biology. So can we, can we uh, make this sort of structure uh, synthetically? And these are the great challenges going forward. Can we learn from biology to go further? And then the, the other example from, from DNA, uh, or, or the use of DNA, which we, we, we find in cells, and this is in a sense going towards the goal that I've been talking about, is really to engineer the DNA sequences. So we can do this in, in, in a lab, and then we can engineer the sequences and program them such that they'll bind in a certain way to make structures or features that we that that we want. And so here we can see a you know a smiley face or a star, uh, and these are all made out of uh, DNA um, 
in fact, these are two dimensional shapes here equally. Uh, you can make three dimensional uh, shapes all from from DNA uh, alone. So there's uh, some fantastic uh, papers coming out on this. Some of these make boxes with lids that can open up with uh, some stimuli. Uh, so all sorts of fantastic work uh, using biomolecules to generate nanoscale uh, features uh, with you know, carefully engineered dimensions, size, and properties. So what about inorganic materials? Um, so, uh, you know, all the uh, proteins and so on that I've, I've just talked about are all formed from organic molecules, you know, amino acid sequences. And whilst this is, uh, you know, uh, fantastic and basically the essence of, uh, uh, of life and what we're, we're all made from, um, it, a lot of the technology we deal with today and interact with, like we're using right now, are built from inorganic materials, such as metals and semiconductors. And these are important uh, technological uh, materials. So, um, you know, what we'd really like is some uh, the ability to make some of these inorganic uh, materials on the nanoscale, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how um, that can be achieved. It can be achieved, and there are some examples of how biology can can achieve this and, and help us synthesize materials on this scale, but currently this is not the main uh, method that we choose to use. So first though, I'd like to just introduce semiconductors, just for those who are less familiar with this. If we take a, a, a an atom and we uh, draw a sketch of the energy levels that the electrons can sit in uh, for our uh, for our atom, it looks something like this this, this kind of like flute like uh, shape, uh, and we can find out where these electronic en energy levels would sit based on quantum mechanical models. So we can use the so-called Schrodinger's equation to predict these these energy levels for an atom. And what we find is we get discrete allowed energy levels for each atom. So if we then covalently bond each of these, uh, uh, lots of these atoms together, for example, uh, for the case of, of silicon, and here's a picture of silicon in the in the in the bottom left. Uh, we can see uh, uh, this is an SDM image of, of silicon. We see see many many of these uh, atoms bound together in a crystalline uh, structure, and these are all covalently bound together. And when you get lots and lots of covalent bonding. Uh, between atoms, you get a, a considerable change to the electronic structure. In other words, uh, this, the, the bonding is leading to a change in the outermost electrons uh, and, uh, and their, their energy levels are being shifted. So if we try and sketch a, a little picture of what, what I mean, this is what we might get. So these are the the atoms which are showed in the uh, in the last slide, and we're putting them all together. And then the outermost uh, energy levels, so the ones closer to the top, are now stretched right across, all the way across all of the atoms in, in our diagram, and they create what's called a band, a valence band in this case. And these ones will be filled with electrons. And then we have a, a, a gap where there is no energy levels, so-called forbidden gap, and we call this the band gap. And then we have uh, the conduction band above that, which is lots of energy levels, but these are uh, uh, don't have any electrons in them yet. So these are absent uh, of electrons. So we can simplify that di diagram. We, we generally don't worry too much about that what what we refer to as the core electrons, those closest to the to the nucleus, and we just concentrate on the uh, uh, valence band and the, and and the conduction band. So I've, I've put these wrong way around. The valence band is is down here, the blue one, and that is filled with electrons. And then the conduction band is up here, and this has very few or no uh, electrons uh, within it. So this provides us with our, our diagram or our simplified diagram 
of our semiconductor of what we're talking about in terms of energy. So if we take our, uh, this is, uh, if you like, a, a, a real um, or diagram of a, of a semiconductor. Uh, and if we, first of all, the bottom here is our uh, highest valence band. And then at the top here, we got our lowest uh, conduction band. So if we then uh, pass in some light, what we can do is we can excite uh, the electron and then Recom and then the electron and the hole will recombine and then we'll get what's called photoluminescence. You'll get the emission of some light or a photon being given out. So this is called photoluminescence or sometimes called fluorescence. So light comes in, it pushes an electron up to the, to the conduction band. And then uh, because it's uh, got an excess of energy, it can drop back down and it can give out light. So this is photoluminescence. So these semiconductors are, are, are really important for almost all the electronic uh, devices that we use. So the key element to all our uh, electronic chips that we have and it's a key parameter, uh, and the key parameter really is the the band gap, uh, which is important for particularly important for the uh, optoelectronic devices such as LEDs and solar cells. And one of the problems with with these bulk semiconductors, large semiconductors, is that they are very fixed band gaps. The material it's made out of fixes what the band gap is, and so therefore that fixes what color of light you get out from that semiconductor. And scientists have been very good at finding the right combinations. But what would be really neat is if you could combine, if you could change for a given semiconductor, you could change that uh, band gap to enable you to finely tune what color emission you get to make uh, more efficient LED displays. So nano semiconductors allow this tuning of the band gap to be realized this size. So what we're really talking about here is, a, is, is another quantum mechanical um, effect, which is called quantum confinement. And electrons have a wave-like behavior. And in semiconductors, the wavelength is around about, or the size of the wave is around about 10 nanometers. So if we make our semiconductor smaller than 10 nanometers, we're really confining this wave inside the structure. And this has quantum mechanical uh, um, consequences, which leads to a change in the effective uh, band gap. And we can understand this by the Bruce equation, and I won't go through all the details of, the, of this expression here, but just to say that the R here is the radius of the particle. So you can see that the band gap uh, E star will increase as the radius decreases. And in quantum mechanics, we refer to this as a particle in a box. So for semiconductor nanoparticles, we call these quantum dots. And once those particles are less than 10 nanometers in size, they start to confine the uh, electrons within the uh, material. And this causes a change in the band gap of the material. And you effectively get different light emitted from each particle. So we can tune this same semiconductor to emit blue light through to red light if we so choose. And what we're really talking about here is uh, is uh, particles or nanoparticles or quantum dots that are 10,000 atoms down to a, a few hundred atoms in, in size. So we can make these uh, and you can make these in in a chemistry lab. Um, you can take a solution of cadmium and then pass through some uh, tellurium uh, into the solution and it will react and then you reflux it and you can grow crystals bigger and bigger and bigger. And what you can see here in the color image in, in, in the center here, you can see some uh, green uh, emitting quantum dots. And then you can see some yellow emitting quantum dots and then orange and then finally going through to red. And what these are is the same material, the same reaction, 
But over time, the crystals are growing in, in size through the reaction conditions. And we are able to um, take a sample out at each stage. And so each one of these will have a different uh, size. And we can measure the sizes of those particles using uh, electron microscopy. And they're all a few nanometers in, in size. One of the concerns, though, is uh, that uh, cadmium-based uh, materials uh, are, are never going to be really that good for, for technological materials because they're found too, too toxic. So we started looking at ways of making uh, cadmium-free uh, quantum dots. And we've chosen uh, one of these materials called copper indium uh, sulfide and demonstrated that we can make copper indium sulfide nanoparticles uh, using uh, a similar uh, reaction uh, conditions and a similar method to what we used before with slightly different arrangements. And this time we're using uh, dodecane file as an organic solvent instead of the, of, of the aqueous solvent before. And we're using higher temperatures. But effectively, we're able to make uh, fluorescent uh, nanoparticles, our quantum dots, our copper indium uh, sulfide. And these are some of the high resolution uh, electron micrograph images of these uh, nanoparticles, all tetrahedrons in this case. So why do we want these uh, quantum dots? So one application, of course, is already available uh, from the shops. This is a QLED TV. So this is sold by Samsung. And the way it works, it has blue LED backlighting. It has then liquid crystal, and then it has red quantum dots and green quantum dots, and then clear parts. So a screen is made of red, green, and blue. And so this combination of, of different colors enables you to have a, a, a more efficient uh, color TV screen. And um, so the example here is instead of using phosphors, you might get 16 million colors from your TV. Uh, you get 64 times 64 uh, more color than you have in your average TV, you end up with 1 billion uh, colors using quantum dot technology. Plus, you get the added gain that it uses less light and is more efficient. What's next, though, we can, we can achieve that. And the next thing really is to build uh, quantum dot LED devices. And so we've got, we can do this in the lab. And as an example, we've done in our lab where we combine uh, various different materials to make what's called a light emitting device. And this time, we're not put, putting light into the quantum dots. We're, we're pure, pu purely using electricity to generate uh, the light. So we're getting uh, emission through this diode. So the other aspect of, of quantum dots I just wanted to touch on, on briefly was that they are nanoparticles and they have very large surface area to volume. And this enables us to t attach molecules to the outside of the quantum dots. And we can do everything, all sorts of molecules we can attach here, including uh, uh, biomolecules uh, onto the to the surfaces. And these uh, molecules here have all sorts of roles, including controlling the growth of the crystals, preventing the agglomeration, and improving the stability, but also provides the chemistry for conjugation. And this can then enable you to uh, do bioimaging within cells. So here is quantum dots with antibodies attached to the outside that will attach to tubulin and these and on the right hand side is a picture of some cells and what you can see is the green fluorescence from the quantum dots showing uh, the tubulin, microtubulin. Um, uh, a topic that I've been working on more recently is can we uh, use quantum dots as an intracellular probe and can we use them to measure uh, redox uh, within uh, individual cells? Uh, and using this technique here, we have uh, molecules which either take or cannot take uh, electrons from the quantum dot to either quench the fluorescence or allow the fluorescence to work. And so that's something we've been uh, working on recently. And of course, there is also the ability to use quantum dots for 
in vivo uh, imaging and there's many, many uh, demonstrations of this in, in the literature where we can use quantum dots, um, uh, inject quantum dots into small animal models and monitor where they go or even target them to uh, tumors uh, within uh, the mouse or the rat. So I just want to uh, move on now to another example of nanomaterials, gold nanoparticles, and I'm going to finish on on, on the gold nanoparticles uh, section. Uh, gold nanoparticles have a long, long history, actually, and this goes back to uh, the days of the Romans, uh, actually, and it, this is um, uh, a cup, uh, and if you shine light through the back of it, it looks very red. Uh, or, or red or pink, and the color that you see from these are actually due to gold uh, nanoparticles. Naturally, the Romans uh, did not know this, um, but um, subsequently we've just rediscovered uh, the use of nanoparticles for generating color. So it's an optical uh, effect. It's a size effect. Again, it's a little bit different from the from the quantum dots size effect. But we can see we've got five nanometer nanoparticles on the left and 90 nanoparticles on the right, and they go from being red all the way to being blue. So what what's going on here? What is the phenomena that's causing this? And the phenomena that's causing this is called surface plasmon resonance, and this is where you have light which then causes the electrons, the free electrons in your metal to then oscillate back and forth. And if this happens at some natural frequency uh, to uh, the to nanoparticle, you get this very strong resonance occurring, which absorbs all, all the light. And this happens in the green part of the spectrum for um, for uh, gold nanoparticles. So it absorbs all the green part of the spectrum and all the um, blue part of the spectrum is scattered light. So you observe red light passing through. So an application we're working on for gold nanoparticles is this idea of using near infrared imaging and photothermal effects to enable them uh, to enable us to treat uh, cancer. So can we heat up cells uh, through the tissue using a laser uh, and enable uh, us to treat uh, cancer and use the nanoparticles to enhance this this effect. We're using green lights no good. So what we can do is we can modify the geometry of the gold nanoparticle into a nanorod and then that enables us to absorb in the near infrared region of the spectrum where light has the most greatest uh, penetration. So we can make these uh, gold nanoparticles very robustly now within our, within our lab, and they've strongly absorbed in the near infrared. And the idea really is to uh, increase um, the tissue temperature from 41 degree, between 41 degrees to 48 uh, degrees Celsius to uh, cause irreversible damage to the diseased tissue. So we can generate uh, heat from these uh, nanoparticles when incident light occurs. Almost all of the energy absorbed by the gold nanoparticles are converted uh, into heat. And using lots and lots of these gold nanoparticles, we can achieve sufficient temperature to cause um, a cellular damage. So another way we uh, can uh, create a near infrared absorption is using a different geometry of gold and this time it's hollow gold nanotubes again they absorb in the near infrared in it in a very similar way and um, this time we use a, a silver nanopart nanowire to as a template and add gold into solution into the in, into the solution of of nano of silver nanowires and we create these uh, nanotube structures which absorb between 700 and 800, uh, 880 nanometers. And again, we can use these um, to heat up uh, cells. And we can see here for, uh, with our laser radiation that with increased concentration of, of gold nanorods, we cause uh, 
a lot of uh, cell death within in an in vitro uh, type experiment. So I just want to finish really on on uh, our latest uh, work um, or one of our latest pieces of work with gold, and it's the thinnest gold uh, in the world. This time we use methylene orange, uh, which is this uh, dye molecule, and we add in a solution of gold, and uh, we are able to leave it at, at room temperature for 12 hours, wash it, and then obtain these gold nanostructures. So this time they're hundreds of uh, nanometers across, but only two uh, uh, atoms thick, so 0 0.42 nanometers uh, thick, so or 48, sorry, uh, nanometers thick. So some of the thinnest, the thinnest example of, of gold ever uh, produced freestanding in, in this way. And so going forward, we'll be looking for uh, different applications of, of this gold and how we can use it uh, in, to create different applications. So world's finest gold created by British scientists. So this is something we are trying to talk uh, and brag about. Uh, it's it obtained lots of lots of uh, um, um, interest within the press and across the newspapers around the world. So we're very very proud of uh, this this work. So just to conclude, uh, really, uh, I talked about uh, the manipulation of atoms and I talked about how uh, biological systems can also manipulate molecules and atoms to create uh, uh, highly precise structures. We can use chemistry uh, and inorganic chemistry also to control the sizes of, of, of crystals. And really, nanoparticle engineering is, is a really, really hot topic. Uh, this ability to control shape, size, composition, and also the surface chemistry is really, really important for sensing new devices, solar cells, displays, you name it, it's of interest in, in, in technology. And so really, it's all about um, really understanding how to change each one of these aspects uh, and use it uh, to its best effect to, uh, to create an application that you uh, desire. And with that, I would just like to thank all the people uh, who've worked on, on some of these projects, including Aberol, who's still uh, just starting to write up the honeys in her third year now. Um, uh, Juan, who's works in Spain. Uh, there's Andrew Harvey, who um, uh, graduated a couple of years ago now and works in the lab in Norway and so on. And I'd also like to thank Professor Steve Evans, Nicole Howden and David Binks and Lars Jurkin and Louise Coletta who all work uh, with me on all, all these different projects and also like to thank uh, all my funders for funding me through all this work so far. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot very much, Kev. Uh, that was really interesting. Uh, you have showed a very wide range of application for the uh, nanomaterials, uh, going from biological effects or biological application to, you know, the TVs and all of these electronic applications. So I think this is covering a very wide range of um, application for nanoscience, and that is really great. Um, so before starting the um, question session so that anyone can ask his question. I would like to check first of all if, uh, because I think, I'm not sure if we still have, uh, so Professor Shinewi is not with us at the meantime. We have also Professor Hassan, the Dean of uh, Faculty of Advanced Basic Science. Would you like to start the question session with us? Hello. Uh, hello, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, good morning, uh, Kev. Good uh, morning. And uh, still, still morning. Anyway. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you very much, Kev. Um, it's a very interesting topic here, and uh, I'm sure the students will benefit from this uh, topic. I know it's, it's a multidisciplinary 
one. Maybe there is uh, some of the of the terminology here is still uh, hard for the students to understand, like quantum dots and it's a quantum sure. mechanics. They will actually do the quantum mechanics on probably ne next year or, or year level yep. at three, uh, year three. Uh, but it, it's a good to just uh, introduce uh, such technology to, to them. Yep. I don't have actually a specific questions here, uh, Radwa and Kev. I think I think we already have people raised their hands, so we can uh, start no, no. with. For me, I, I don't have. I just uh, I would like to thank Kev actually for giving this uh, seminar, and uh, we are looking for more. And I leave the Q and A for you, Radwa, because you are the moderator of this. Thank you very thank much. You. Yeah, th thank you. Kev. So I think we have uh, our first question from uh, this is Dr. Ahmed Abdelmagi. Dr. Ahmed Ibrahim, would you like to start your question? Thank you, Dr. Rahma, for allowing me to to attend this this uh, interesting webinar, and 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 I would like to uh, say very special thanks to Dr. Kevin for the very beautiful and nice talk. So thank you so much for this interesting talk. It's so actually, uh, actually, I, I I was working on the on the a supramolecular structure of some molecules on the on the nano surface, especially the nano carbon. So one of my projects, I was working with gold nanotube, so I got very excited with your uh, valuable talk, actually. So if 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 you uh, would mind, so could you please let me know about the how much size of the uh, hollow gold tubes around how, how much nanometer? Oh, so they were uh, around about um, uh, 30 nanometers in diameter, but then the thickness of the gold was uh, around about two or three nanometers in thickness. Okay, so I, I, I may miss date, but I, I would like to ask about, the, can, can it use for the, the host guest applications, for example? So can we insert uh, some, some in nanoparticles or oxides inside it? Yeah, so that's a so that's a really really great question. Actually, there's been we published some work quite uh, recently um, where we show that um, actually we can make longer uh, um, nanotubes in these, and we can track uh, track them going into cells. Uh, and actually, the idea there is that we load uh, the nanotubes with, with with a drug that is then released uh, inside mm -hmm. inside the cell. So yes, it's absolutely possible, um, and 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 that's something we're working on. I we haven't got all the answers to that because it's it's quite difficult to control the chemistry on the inside versus the chemistry on the outside. So that that is one of the challenges, but we are making some progress towards achieving that. Uh, OK, so and, and how about the lens, the lens of the tube? Uh, so, yeah, we can make them uh, several uh, hundred nanometers in, in, in length now. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the examples that we showed earlier were around about um, 50 nanometers in length. <coughs> Okay, so have you suffered from any any defect structure during the fabrication? Do we lose the structure when we fabricate? Yes, yes. Yeah, some, so not all of the rods um, uh, are, are, are are obtained nicely. They tend some of them have uh, holes in the in the in the sides of the tube, so they're not all perfect. Uh, yes. So it's all about uh, so we, so it's a, a, a process called galvanostatic displacement. So we start yes. with silver and then mm -hmm. we displace with gold uh, and it doesn't work perfectly uh, across the whole nanorod. So we've been working on uh, trying to make the wall thickness a little bit thicker to try yeah. and um, solve this uh, problem. Uh, I'll direct you towards our most recent publication. I think you might be of interest to you. Yep, yep, yep. great, great one. Thanks so much okay. for, for the nice talk and for the nice work. Thanks so much. No problem. Yep. Dr. Rado, please.
Okay, Dr. Muhammad, I believe you have a question. You can carry on. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Kev. Uh, thank you very much for your interesting talk and your nice picture, which back me to uh, when I was studying for my PhD to South Yorkshire in Sheffield University. <laughs> very close to us, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, I was finished. I finished my PhD with the Morris Skolnick Group in Electric and Electronic Engineering and Physics. Uh, my question is, uh, can, do you have any application for the quantum dots in drug delivery? Yeah, that's that's a that's a good question. Um, so, uh, one of the well, one of the applications for for drug delivery that we were um, using the quantum dots for was really to track where the drugs were are going within cells. Um, I think the ultimately the problem in going forward with quantum dots in 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 drug delivery is they're they're probably too toxic for 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 humans, right? So there are some issues with with developing the quantum dots for 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 humans, but for uh, animal studies and for you know in, in vitro experiments into cells and to try and understand the mechanisms uh, of what's going on. Uh, yeah, sure, quantum dots have application there. The second uh, area, which I was just sort of only touched on very very briefly was we're trying to understand, use quantum dots as redox sensors. So really determine how the environment within the cell. So cancer cells are, tend to be very reducing environments. So um, uh, due to the nature of how they obtain their, their energy. And so the idea is that um, if we can you have used the quantum dots as an indicator to tell us how reducing the, the quantum dot is. And then if we use an inhibitor uh, or a drug that can change the properties of the cells to make it uh, to switch off some of these cancer-like uh, properties and, and make it less reducing, then the quantum dots will tell us whether we've been successful or, or, or not. And so we're really trying to develop as a platform for kind of drug screening rather than um, rather than uptake as such. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Uh, my, my second question also, I noticed that you can able to grow hollow uh, road of gold. Yes. Uh, and uh, hollow, hollow uh, nano, um, nano device is the key for the photonic crystal uh, technology. Uh -huh. Did you try to grow some kind of photonic using this uh, artificial uh, artificial uh, <laughs> nano nano uh, nano rods or nano. Uh... That's a really good question. No, no, we we we've never actually tried that. Um, it'd be really interesting to to try it. Our focus was purely on the sort of biomedical applications for oh, those right. for those, but um, but there's no reason why we couldn't uh, adapt it. Um, yeah, I think um, our, our slight issue that we have with our gold nanorods is that we we can control the diameter very, very well, uh, and we control the thickness of the shell reasonably well, but the length of the nanorod is more difficult to control. So it, it depends if that's a, an important parameter or not. Yes, yeah, so in photonic crystal, the, uh, the inside diameter is very, very important because it reflects the uh, the wavelengths of the light which you can reflect out of the device and this is can cause very hard uh, work in uh, electron beam lithography however if you can grow it with hollow controlled uh, inside diameter this is a very very good option for the photonic crystal technology fantastic we should talk some more <laughs> yes right okay Thank you. so um do you have any more questions? So um, while we are waiting, if any of the students has questions, I would like to just make sure. Um, I'm not 100% sure that all of our students know the differences between photoluminescence and fluorescence and all of these types. So can you give a brief hint about differences between these and how can you differentiate between them? 
Okay, that's a good question. So um, I guess photoluminescence is, uh, is the most general name for this process of putting light into a material and then um, obtaining emission out from the material. So photoluminescence is, is very general. If the process is of putting light in and getting light out is very fast, so it happens within nanoseconds or within a few hundreds of nanoseconds, we usually refer to it as fluorescence. So, but if it's slow, uh, it's a very slow process, then we refer to it as phosphorescence. So, so if you like, the general name is, is photoluminescence, but then if it's a fast process, it's fluorescence. And if it's a slow process, it's phospholuminescence. Is that, right. Does that make sense? Uh, it makes to me. I hope it is the same. <laughs> I for hope you. it does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Also, you mentioned Kev about the quantum dot size and that you can control the size by controlling the reaction. And controlling the size is gonna give different uh, fluorescent color or different light at the end. Right. So how how is the difference between them? Um, how is it sensitive to the differences in sizes? So I mean, how many nanometer range size is changing the color? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. So it's, it's actually, well, it's very sensitive in the sense that you can very finely tune the peak maximum from the, from, from the size. So probably the minimum sort of size that you get emission <laughs> is around about two nanometers in diameter. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the example I showed with the cadmium telluride, the small green, the smallest ones were green emitting. And then uh, the largest ones uh, that I showed were red emitting, and they were around about four nanometers in diameter. So that whole color range is a difference of about two nanometers in size. So, so actually, right. it's really quite sensitive to the size, but it is possible to um, obtain a very quite a narrow size range. So with just maybe uh, you know ten percent variation in size uh, between, mm -hmm. between a whole sample uh, that that's that's possible uh, one of the challenges is 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 reducing that d distribution even further to make it very very narrow so that mm -hmm. you can sort of assemble them into crystals of of, of nanoparticles uh, they're all assembled together uh, and so for that you need just you know a variation of just a few percent uh, that's more difficult Right, yeah, yeah, I guess it is. Um, <clears throat> one more question also related to the uh, the thinnest gold, um, the leads, <clears throat> the leads leading thinnest gold. Um, <laughs> so we are talking about the the heat or the thermal um, effect on tissue and how it can help in cancers and things. So how deep can it penetrate? And is it having really, um, I mean, if it is really deep inside, Will it have an effect on the tissue layers until it reaches the, the depth of the cancer cell? So how can you control this? Yeah, so, so this is really important. So so um, so through, uh, through, say, skin, uh, through regular your outer skin tissue, um, you probably only have a penetration of, a, of, of two centimeters at the very most, you know, millimeters, really. Um, so so it's quite it would be quite challenging to deliver infrared light uh into your inner organs through through your skin if you like mm -hmm. um it that said though it um there are situations where you can get light to other parts of your body either through uh keyhole surgery uh, where you might use uh, deliver light through a fiber optic uh, mm -hmm. or, or or there's other parts of your body that you, you your throat, for example, where you can uh, deliver light. Uh, in terms of uh, damaging um, uh, healthy tissue, so what our aim is is the the, the gold heats up, uh, absorbs much more light than the uh, than than the tissue. Uh, does so the idea is to minimize the, the the amount of light exposed to the healthy tissue and just maximize mm. the amount of light that hits the the nanorod so we would be working at um we we look very carefully at the laser safety levels uh yeah. to, to find out what kind of levels of light we can use that 
results in no damage to 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 your healthy tissue, and I think that's really important um, to get to get right. Um, yeah, so so I, it, it is a it is a challenge getting light um, penetrating deep into in, into tissue, but I think there are ways around it, and it probably the um, initial sort of applications would be things like skin cancer, uh, neck, breast. Um, yeah, cancer. I was thinking about the same thing. Is it going to have a bit of restricting application side till now? Yeah, for now, probably <clears throat> yes, yes. Yeah, that's okay. right. Okay. Yeah, that's great. So I think we have another question from Dr. Mohammed Imam. No, no, I don't have. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's mine. Rahman? It's mine. Actually. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Uh, actually, I, I, I have uh, two questions. One of them has been already answered by Dr. Keith Sachs. So it, uh, it was about how to protect the healthy cells. Okay. And the second one, maybe to, to, to make our students get more involved in the talk. So I know you have already mentioned it at the beginning of the talk. So could you please just highlight it again about the methods used to uh, fabricate the nanostructure materials? Just just so, as a conclusion. So, so the the for fabricating the nanomaterials such, such as the quantum dots and uh, generally generally like top yeah bottom, so, bottom, top bottom top bottom and self-assemble and so on sure just, yeah. just to get, make a student get get more involved in the talk sure so um one of the yes yeah, so one of the key aspects of all the materials that i talked about um you know and all the methods i talked about they were all about uh making uh, your materials from individual atoms or individual molecules into a larger structure rather than the other way around. So rather than taking a block of material and trying to break it up into small fragments and small particles uh, of, of, of nanoparticles, we aim to build from the atoms upwards. And so generally, the uh, for making the nanoparticles that I talked about, we start off with a solution. Uh, so we, we we do it in a in a chemical way in a solution, and we have basically the the material we want in the form as ions dissolved in 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 that solution, and then we are adding in the uh, 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 something into the solution that will reduce those ions into uh, a metal, say, or, or, or a semiconductor that enables us to, to build the material up much larger. The trick that we have is that we also have in our solution some uh, stabilizing molecules, which are uh, usually uh, surfactant-like molecules, a bit like soap molecules, that surround the outside of the, the, the small particles that we, we, we start to create, and they restrict the sort of rate in which they grow. And that restriction in, in the rate in which they grow enables us to then control the, the, the size of the particles that we end up with. If we just had our ions in solution and just put reducing agent in there, we wouldn't have any control over the size and shape of, of the materials we have. So a really, really key uh, part of, of, of what we need to do to control uh, the structures that we have is to have um, molecules in the solution that really restrict the growth in, in, in some way. That's great. Thanks, Kev. Uh, I think we have raised hands from Mahmoud Ahmed Al Jazar. Would you like to talk, Ah Mahmoud? Yeah, uh, I have a question. Uh, the gold particles, uh, when it uh, become separate from each other, it have a red color. Where, from where does that uh, that red color come from? That's that's a great question. So, so the the red color um, it, it was actually something that that w um, was um, first investigated by Michael Faraday um, back in uh, 1860. So he was curious to why the um, Romans could make uh, glass uh, called ruby glass. And he knew gold was present within uh, within the glass, but he didn't understand why it it was red. And so he he actually was the first person. Michael Faraday was the first person to synthesize to deliberately synthesize small particles 
of gold. Now, he didn't call them uh, nanoparticles. He didn't know how small they actually were. But the first thing, the experiment that he did do was he, he shone light through the solution of the particles. And what he could see was the light is scattered Right. So you get this process of light coming in and then the light being scattered by the particles. So if it was just a solution, the light would pass through and it would not be scattered. But the light is scattered because there's particles in the solution, the small nanoparticles scatter the light. And the light scattering is uh, causes uh, is is more effective or has more effect on the UV and the blue range. Uh, blue range of the electromagnetic spectrum. So, so all your blue light is basically scattered very effectively. Uh, so, so that's the first part of, of uh, first part of the answer. And then the second part of the answer was is the phenomena of surface plasmon resonance. So it turns out that gold um, strongly absorbs the green light because all the uh, f uh, conducting electrons within the gold nanoparticle oscillate within the within the green wavelength of, of, of light. So all the green light is strongly absorbed by by the gold nanoparticles, and that generates a little bit of heat when that when that happens. So if you now imagine that the blue light is all uh, is all scattered and the red green light is all absorbed you're ba basically left with red light that passes through and so that's what gives rise to the uh, red color uh, from from gold nanoparticles if you do the same thing with a silver uh, you get more of a, a yellow color because the surface plasmon is shifted into the blue range of the spectrum from the green to the blue range of the spectrum. And so you get a more yellow color from, from, from the particles. So you can tune the material and you can choose the, tune the size of the gold, which changes that, the position of that green band a little bit. Uh, or, 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 or even more extremely, you can make them longer, like I did for the nanorods, and then you get very strong absorption in the near infrared region of the spectrum. So it's all about those electrons within the gold oscillating in the elect in in the light, in the field of light, basically the light wave. Okay, thank you, Doctor. That's great. Thanks a lot, Kev. Um, um, I'm a bit cautious about time, but I can see Dr. Mohammed, you still have your hand raised. So do you want no. to say something or? Nothing. No? Nothing. Oh, Nothing oh. Thank you okay. very much indeed. Th that's great. OK, thanks a lot, Kev. Um, um, I can't see any more questions, so I would like to thank you again. Uh, that was really helpful to all of us, actually, and specifically for students. So that was great, and we'll be looking forward for some more um, talks like these ones. Thank you very much. It was a great honor to uh, give a presentation. I fully, fully enjoyed it, and uh, I look forward to further conversations in the future. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Thanks a lot. OK. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Keith. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thanks, Kev. شكرا على التراضي على المحاضره الشيقه دي يعني